Welcome everybody. This is our Rise Up and Carve demo by Julian Little Bear Sloyd, um, as he's known on Instagram. He is going to be doing an axing demo of how he axes out his Welsh call spoon, which is our template for the Ruac Spoon Challenge 15 template. It's uh, based on a traditional Welsh call spoon, which Julian is well versed in. Um, uh, correct me if I say anything wrong here at some point, Julian, but I believe you've actually done or were working on your PhD thesis uh, having to do with Welsh call spoons, but I'll let you uh, address your background yourself. But anyway, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Um, Julian, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, about how you came to be doing Welsh call spoons? Uh, okay, so... Um... I have a Welsh background. Um, my granddad uh, was comes from a long line of dairy farmers in the south of Wales. Um, so he grew up in uh, in Carmarthenshire in a a little village called Clunginog. Um, and I've been there. I've only been there once, but I um, have always been interested in the continuity of the wood culture in Wales from the past until now. So like in a lot of countries when the industrial revolution rolled by, people forgot about hand carved wooden spoons and they forgot about, you know, handmade wooden bowls and, and stuff like that. But for whatever reason in, in Wales, people just kept on doing it. And they, they didn't seem to have that same sort of loss of, of wood culture that, that occurred elsewhere in the world. So that's what made me interested in Welsh spoons. And um, I did do quite a bit of research for it, for, um, it was a it was a thesis for my history honors, okay. um, so not quite as advanced as a PhD, and I didn't even finish it. But I did do all the research. Okay. <laughs> very and good. One day, one day I'll get back to my thesis. I'm planning to make it into a series of video essays. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I have made some YouTube videos about cow spoons already. Um, so you can go back and have a look at those. Um, some of them are a little bit old and. Um, various things have changed in, in, in either my carving method or my production quality since then, but, but you can always go and have a look at those. So anyway, the, the cowl spoon, um, cowl is a broth. It's a, it's a stew that's popular in Wales. Um, some people call it the Welsh national dish. Um, anyway, all you really need to know about it is that it's, it's a peasant, it's a peasant dish. It's not a rich dish. It's, um, it's, like you, you make a soup out of whatever, whatever meat you can get and whatever vegetables you can grow in your garden. You know, it's not like um, it's not like fine cuisine. And it's it's cowl is just means broth. So it, it's a very extendable um, concept to any number of of soupy things. But Excellent. typically, typically it would have some root vegetables, some kind of meat stock you know, like a uh, basic mm -hmm. broth. And so the cowl spoon is a, a spoon that evolved in Wales um, alongside the um, the cowl bowl, which doesn't get talked about as much, but is, is just as important. Um, oh, wow. It just means your broth spoon, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it really just means a soup spoon, but they, they over time they came to have this distinctive shape. Um, so I'll show you. Before we get started, I'll, I'll show you the, the Rise Up and Carve Spoon Challenge 15 spoon. Excellent. All right, so here it is. Now, those of you who've seen some traditional cow spoons before, you'll know that mine aren't really super, super traditional, um, but this is the shape that I, after carving a lot of these, this is what I've come around to that's my favorite feet for myself and my use. Um, so I like to have a, a nice wide lozenge shaped bowl and that's very characteristic of the style. And I like to have this kind of swoopy profile which makes me happy um, and it doesn't detract from the function of the spoon. In fact, the, the crank on the bowl is, is, is what you want to be right for slurping, you know, like you, you slurp from the side of the spoon. Um, and that's why we've got this, this oval shape, sideways oval shape. 
um, the, the slipping from the side. And if you've awesome. got a big mouth, you can do it like this as well. <laughs> uh, does anyone have any like? I know um, Dan had a had a question before we get before we get chopping, and and that was about grain orientation, right? Yeah. So my question was, when you're splitting for your to get your blank, is there a particular orientation that uh, suits a cow spoon better? Because yes. I guess you've got a reverse crank going on and so there's potential for a lot of short grain in the neck that makes sense yeah um i like to do them radially right um and for anyone who might not know um a radial billet if i was to just draw some lines on this block of wood the radial billet would come out of here okay yep and the reason for that is that um because, um, and this is, um, we'll, we'll feel free to, to ignore the basics if you already know all this stuff, but when wood, uh, wood is made out of rings and as it's drying out, those rings want to flatten out. And so when you carve a tangentially oriented spoon where the rings are in line with the plan of the spoon, you're going to get the sides of the bowl cupping upwards as the wood dries out while your roughed out spoon is drying. And for a cow spoon, that's um, extra disadvantageous because you've got that wide bowl that's quite narrow. So if you don't, if you carve it from a tangential orientation in wood that likes to move quite a lot, um, for example, I carved one out of apple wood the other day, your spoon bowl is going to turn into a smile um, as it dries out. Um, so that's why I like to carve the radially split wood because it's more stable. And I also, for cowl spoons, I enjoy a plain aesthetic as much as possible um, because they were this utilitarian spoon and it's, it's not about sort of finding the most beautiful timber. It's, it's, it's really just making a spoon to drink soup. Um, any, anything else before we get started? Do you carve from a, uh, it looks like the, the, if that's the piece of wood you're actually gonna be axing your blank out of it's straight wood as opposed to using crook wood. Yeah, yeah well, they, they were historically were always made from straight wood. Okay. Um, and that's because the other thing that you should know about cow spoons is that um, with a few exceptions, cow spoons were not a hobby, they were an industry. Um, okay. So the spoon carvers who made these spoons, it wasn't something they did because um, they liked carving spoons. This was their job. They would um, they would go to the sycamore forests, they would fell a tree, they would bring home the logs, and then they would make all sorts of things for people's houses, but also mostly for the dairy industry. So they'd be making butter pats, they'd be making butter scraping, and anything for the for the manufacture of, of, of milk products was all made from sycamore wood by these, by these um, they were called, um, you know what, I don't remember, but we'll talk about that next week. Um, okay. <laughs> these, guys, um, these guys worked in a workshop where they made all sorts of treen, um, and they pretty much exclusively used straight-grained, clear sycamore wood. So bonus points if you can find any of that. Interesting. Because um, that's what grows in Wales, um, in, the, in the hills, it's, it's sycamore. And it's the ideal wood for spoon carving because it doesn't move very much when it dries. It doesn't misbehave. It has no odor, no taste. Um, and it's very plain and easy to carve. So that's, that's uh, in the mind of someone who wants to make 100 spoons in a day with the least amount of like uh, disturbance to their method, then that, those are tick, tick, tick as far as wood choice is concerned. So a quick question then, what you refer to as sycamore in the UK and or Australia presumably as well, I don't know if they're the same as what we refer to as sycamore here in the US. Um, uh, so so I believe what you're calling sycamore is, is a type of maple, correct? The Acer pseudoplantanus. Okay. Um, and believe... isn't it right? In, in Wales, they call the sycamore Welsh maple. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, because I, I have actually found what you were talking about when I was uh, living in Wales for six months. And yeah, it's almost all that grows there. I couldn't find almost any other tree. 
like maybe some it makes complete sense that they use that for the um for their industry in the yeah. in the sort of 17th to 19th centuries yeah interesting All right so um we're going to take a, a, a short break while I try and split my log open, and then we'll get right back to it. Very good. Um, so feel free to chat amongst yourselves. You don't have to all mute yourself while I bang on this log. So does anybody know what here in the US, what we refer to as sycamore, uh, is that a type of poplar? I thought our sycamore was also a type of maple just because of the shape of the leaves. It looks like it, kind of big fluffy is. maple leaves. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't know. I thought I'm speculating based on leaf shape, Chuck. Got it. Does anybody here have a definitive answer? I'm no, looking it up. I'm looking it up now. If I find anything definitive, I'll let you know. I heard what I found was that We we lost you there, Kevin. Apparently, what Acer pseudoplatanus, which they call sycamore in the UK, we call sycamore maple here. Even though I've not ever heard that. Okay. So I'm thinking that for us in the U.S., then uh, probably just about any type of maple would be preferable. So ours is called Platinus Occidentalist. Occidentalist, also known as American sycamore. Um, well, maple, maple is a good choice. Uh, it has shares many of the same characteristics. It has nice plain wood. It's very mm. strong and it's not so hard to carve when it's green. Um, another good contender is uh, plane tree or London plane. Um, is also related to the sycamore family, has some of the same properties. Um, and all of these woods also have very attractive radial flecking um, when you split them in this particular way. Okay, excellent. Yeah, what, Thanks, we call, what we call sycamore is a plane tree. That's apparently what platinum is, plain, the plane species. Okay. Plain as in like London plain, not plain as in right. plain green. Yep. Yeah. Um, I will be carving a piece of jacaranda today, which is an Australian native. Uh, that just happens to be what I've got. Gotcha. So, I mean, it's nice to talk about what the ideal wood is, but really the ideal wood is whatever you have. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose that's exactly what the Welsh were doing. They had loads yeah. of this wood and so they found out the best way to use it, which makes sense. Absolutely. Um, like, for example, the other timber that grew in Wales was um, was Welsh oak, which is completely unsuitable. So, like, um, obviously it's great for other stuff, but not for making spoons. All right. So, step one is to use your fro and your biggest club, which unfortunately, in my case, is comically small. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to take my log about this diameter. They typically would have used the wood from the branches because the wood from the trunk would be large enough to turn into bowls, which they would have done on a pole lace. Okay. All right. So I didn't get a great split on this, but it's definitely good enough. I'll take half. I'm going to quarter it. Ideally, you want to have a log that is large enough that after you quarter it, you still have about three inches of width here in your billet. Um, I'm curious, do you own many traditional uh, Welsh cowl spoons? Uh, no, I don't, uh, because they are an antique, they're a collector's item and they're very expensive. Right. Um, so, have you got, Welsh, sorry, go on. Um, Welsh antiques 
have had a real flourish in interest over the past few years. And um, anything that is like legitimate from the from the Welsh countryside in the 19th century coming up for auction or private sale today will, will fetch a good amount of money because anyone who look at, looks at them can see that they've got this sort of gorgeous country aesthetic to them that a lot of people want to have in their homes. Okay, so I've got the quarter. I've got a quarter, and now I'm going to split this into a billet. This is a Excellent. lot longer, than me, but I've got checks on either end that I'm going to need to cut off. Gotcha. And you want your billet to be pretty thick because we're going to put a lot of curve into this spoon and you want to have a bit of material to work with for that. So my split ran pretty good, but not perfect. So I'm going to tidy that up with my axe before I keep going. Speaking of which, um, holler up if you can't see what I'm doing very well, and I'll try and make a change. Yeah, so far it looks pretty good. Is anyone else trying to carve along with Julian? Everyone else is just watching. All right. No, I'm just being a couch potato. All right. No, sounds good. Or a chair potato in my case. Uh, I'm going to trim off the checks now, which, which is not really important for um, for the method, but I thought you should know why I'm why I'm going to be wasting so much of this billet is because there's two or three inches on either side that I need to remove to get down to good wood. If you are someone who likes to measure things, your billet should be about 20 centimeters long, 20 to 22 centimeters long. Um, the cow spoon is like longer than you think. Definitely longer than a Swedish style spoon. You know if the dimensions of the cow spoon are directly related to the cow bowl. And because of the type of food they're eating, perhaps it was a big, deep bowl, so they needed something big, big and deep. Yeah. So I, I don't. I've not seen a lot of the original bowls, but um, but obviously they go as a pair, right? You got your cow spoon yeah. and your cow bowl. Um, one, they're both made of sycamore. Just the bowl is pole lathe turned, and the spoon was hand carved. The Welsh also made pole lathe turned spoons, uh, and they would sometimes make ladles that way, and they would have a similar design aesthetic to the cow spoon. They're just bigger. So for those of us in America, the uh, 20 to 22 centimeter is about uh, right around eight inches to eight and three quarter inches, somewhere in that range. I know you guys are smart enough to do the math, but I figured I'd state it just in case. All right. So I'll give you an idea of how this spoon is going to fit into this billet. Can, can everyone see that? Yep. All right. Yep. And when we're talking about thickness, can you see how this is going to fit inside here? Mm. I get my finger out of the way, but. How thick would you say that is? Um, let me grab my imperial ruler. Speaking of rulers, um, everyone should get one of these old style yeah. old rulers. Um, they're the best for this kind of thing. So my billet is about 
two and three quarters, but three is better wide. Okay. And it's about one and a half, but two is better deep. Okay. So um, two by three is a preference. Yeah, and that will give you, like if you've not carved one before, that's gonna give you enough wiggle room. If you've carved a few, then you can make more with less. Gotcha. I'm, I'm curious, what did what part of uh, axing out the cow spoon did you find the most difficult when you first started uh, trying to make them? Um, well, I'd say what's the most difficult is is order of operations because if you, um, if I like to get my necks down pretty thin and the bowl is pretty big. So if you sort of do things in the wrong order, it's very easy to chop right through or just snap off the neck of your spoon while you're axing it out. Mm, yeah. And I've broken quite a few that way. The original ones are significantly more chunky than the ones that I make um, because they weren't sort of art objects like I make them. They were they were made very, very efficiently for sale at market. So if you imagine if you were going to mass produce a spoon, mm. how would you make one of these design elements? And that's what how you begin to understand why the original ones are the way they are. Um, so I'm going to make a stop for my crank. And the stop cut is going to go not two thirds down the bowl like you would like you might do for an eating spoon, but it's going to go at the base of the bowl because we want the lip of our bowl to be flat. And that is very consistent with the original spoons that all have a flat lip. Okay. So I'm going to eyeball it, but if you want to, you can measure back um, according to the template. I like to keep a little bit of extra wood on the front um, so that the tip of my bowl is going to be about a centimeter back from the edge of my billet. Um, and that will prevent any little chip out of the edge of my billet from ruining my spoon. Got it. And if you're working with a uh, slightly undersized billet like I am, basically whatever thickness you leave here underneath the stop cut is, is going to be the thickness of the neck of your spoon where it meets the bowl, okay? So this is gonna be where the back of the bowl goes. So this, the depth of this stop cut is, is important. Um, so you, you can leave a little bit extra if you're not sure but um, you definitely want to sort of take care with that cut um, because you don't want to get too far down the process and then find out that you've scuttled your ship when you left the port. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now I'm just going to do some, some really aggressive chops down to the bottom of my stop cut. And now if you were making some other kind of spoon, you might start your, your chop stop cuts up from the top, but we're not going to do that. We're going to chop at a steep angle from close to the line. And that's because you want to leave enough thickness for that pronounced hump. That's correct, yeah. Okay. And that is the same technique that you would do when you want to carve a, a dolphin spoon. Yep. Uh, in fact, my cow spoon design is kind of a hybrid between a traditional cow spoon and a traditional dolphin spoon. And I'm yeah. making that I enjoy from both of those. Um, historical designs. I suppose you would call it a reverse um, or like the, the keel. It's kind of a reverse keel. That's right. See, it has no keel. Uh, if you put a keel on it, that's that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. So they kind of put it up top. Yeah. And the other thing is you might be tempted to put a nice curve in between your bowl and your handle. But that is also something that is not part of the traditional shape. The <laughs> traditional shape has a sharp 90 degree internal corner where the bowl meets the handle. And my theory on that is because it's easier to make consistent spoons that way. Because carving a nice curve in there is fiddly and it takes time. So I'm sorry, I'm not catching. Where is this 90 degree? Um, here. There's no ah, curve here. Got it. Okay. Um, you can carve one with a curve. Let me go grab one so you can see the difference. That's 
it's also important to avoid the disdain of the traditional spoon community. If you put a graceful <laughs> curve there, people are really, uh, really like nasty about it. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, just so that you're aware, your audio is really uh, garbled and broken up. Okay. But just so you're aware, he's calling in from the International Space Station. We appreciate <laughs> that. Okay, so here is, here is my example. I've got two cow spoons here. Um, this one actually is sycamore. Just so this is what it looks like when it's aged a bit and it's been used for a while. Okay. Um, so on this one, I did a tiny little radius here. Um, and on this one, I've kept it... Um, 90 degrees yep. and, um, and you'll find some like this um, from the later later half of the 19th century but all of the really old ones have this um another question while you're on it while you're showing it it looks like the lip on the 90 degree one is actually raised above the level of the handle so it's like relieved away from above the handle is that correct yeah. no okay you see that um and no, don't read into it because that's just a mistake. Right. So that one is not, but the other one was it is the lip above. Okay, so it's not. Okay, it almost looked like it actually raised above the level. A very, very small amount. Okay. Got it. Uh, it's just a detail. Um, Got it. The reason it looks that way is because there is a little. If you can see it, I don't know if you can. There's a little ridge here. Yeah. Um, that, that goes underneath the bowl slightly. Okay. Um, on Excellent. some of the original spoons, they had quite a pronounced lip here that goes above the level of the handle. Okay. Um, so that's definitely um, definitely an option. A design option, got it. Okay, so um, now I'm going to chop in from the front. And uh, just, uh, I'm sure everyone knows that when you cut the crank from the front of your billet, that you lean over your block and chop from the side. But if you don't, that's what I'm going to do, and you can see how I do it. So when I do this, I like to get, get all of the garbage out, out from around your feet, <laughs> for starters, and then lean down over your work so that you can sight directly in line with your chop, right? That's going to help you with an accurate cut. And um, just a, a point of, since we're here and I'm holding my axe, a point of... Um, of effective axe work is you've got this nice heavy axe, mine weighs over a kilo. You, you don't need to use your arm muscles and you definitely don't need to use your shoulder. So keep that shoulder locked, keep your elbow locked even, and just let the weight of the axe fall and just assist the velocity of the axe with your wrist on a nice chopping motion like this. I'm holding it pretty close in. This, this is just basic stuff, but maybe it's gonna help someone. Yep. All right, I'm gonna chop off the corner first. And then I'm going to chase it down into my line. And that's just a line that I'm visualizing, but if you want to, you can draw it on. And as I get closer to the corner, I'm going to need to move the wood closer to the edge of my block so that I can clear the chip and get straight to the bottom of the corner. Just do a little, a few little chops to tidy it up. And then I just lean on the wood with my body weight. Mm -hmm. And here is, here is the crank. Okay. Can it, yep. You can all see that. Yep. Yeah, excellent. So at this stage, so you can see I've got this flat in one go, but if you're not able to do that, then fiddle with it until it's flat. Because if you flatten it now, it's going to save time later. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to just tidy up the top surface of my billet and then we'll draw on our design. All right. So this is our billet at this point. I've just tidied up the top surface. Um, I'm gonna draw on my design. Now, if you don't know, 
you should all go out and buy black, blue, or green watercolor pencils. Um, they work the best. I've never found anything that works better. And um, there's no need to stain your wood like you would with a Sharpie. I like these, um, you see it, Albrecht Dürer from Faber-Castell. They're the best ones that I've found so far for this. Um, so I'm going to draw the neck first, vaguely in the center, and I'll draw it pretty much to final thickness. If you don't get it right the first time, you just sort of smudge your lines until it looks okay. Do you typically freehand draw all your... Uh... Uh, with, with some... Well, it depends what you mean by freehand. Um, I draw the bowl, and then I use a ruler for the handle. Okay. So I, I just do this in my lap, and I just use my hand to sort of scribe an arc, if that makes sense. Like I kind of move the wood around while I'm, while I'm drawing. Mm -hmm. um, you could always use a template or you could make, make, find like an oval shape that appeals to you. The thing about cow spoons is that there is no consistent unifying shape. People, you just carve whatever shape you want. Some of them are round. Some of them are this kind of lozenge shape that I like to do. Some of them, like, you know, it really doesn't matter. Some, most of them aren't even symmetrical and they don't even approximate symmetry. Interesting. I have a question for you, Julian. Yes. Do you, do you have a personal connection to weights or just a fan of their spoons or how did you come to oh, find yeah. this um, So you, you might, you, you missed the start of my introduction where, where I said that, um, that my family has has ties to Wales and and my granddad um, grew up in the south of Wales on a dairy farm. Um, uh -huh, I see. Cool. And Thanks. I've only been I've only been to Wales one time myself, but um, I do I enjoy what I enjoy is the um, the sort of carefree aesthetic of these of these spoons. I, I find them to be sort of unpretentious, very functional, and and um, sort of they, they've got this charm about them um, which is why as I was explaining earlier that there's this real flourishing in in the Welsh antiques industry like if you've ever read um, if you haven't read it you should go out and buy a copy of John Brown's Welsh stick chairs yes and, read that. and that will explain some of this cultural stuff that I'm talking about definitely look it up thanks and we, yeah. we really enjoy your spoon that we have traded with you, or I traded with you. It's, yeah, I'm, I, it so is very, very functional. Time, so I'm, I'm very happy about that. Okay, so here is the portion of the spoon that I typically draw freehand. Um, you can make this little area as long as, or as short as you like. Um, you can make the handle straight. You don't have to do this detail here. Um, some of the handles on the original spoons are just straight squares. Um, and the reason they did it that way is so that they could clamp it in a vise to hollow the bowl. Mm. Um, so as I was saying, um, form follows function and a lot of the design elements ha just have to do with how is the most efficient way to make a spoon. Now, the next thing I like to do online is draw some straight lines these might not stay straight, but I, and then I'll just do a little curve on the top. All right. And this is about all of the drawing that I'm going to do, with a few little exceptions. Um, and I typically just sort of go around, tidy up any little inconsistencies and just fiddle with it until I like the look of it. And I'm, I, I would be happy with this. So I'm going to put some stop cuts in here to split off the waste. And uh, you can't see this, but my laptop is currently sitting on a workbench, um, a low style workbench, which is what I like to keep next to my chopping block. And I use that for all of my drawing, sawing, and other sort of operations that are a bit fiddly to, to hold on to on your chopping block. Okay. 
Um, so I actually have a, a I'm not going to move the camera because I don't want to get it back to where it was, but I've got a, a setup of holdfasts and pegs and stuff, and I can choose a variety of them so that I can, I don't have to fiddle around holding onto things while I try and cut them. Got it. Do you do just a single cut on each side? Because I've seen some people do like parallel like cuts to give an extra measure of uh, safety. Yeah, um, so I don't know who did it first, but I got this from Adam Hawker. Um, mm. He does, or at least it's yeah. how he teaches. Um, so I like to do two parallel cuts, as you say, because then if you miss, then you're going to you're going to strike this sacrificial wood instead of this bowl of your spoon. Yep. And okay. the cow spoon is especially vulnerable because it's got such a wide bowl. Yeah. And a lot, like if you hit it, it definitely will split. Yep. Um, and I just leave a couple of mils away from my handle for these cuts. Okay. And because I know I'm working with nice straight grain wood, now I'm going to split off the waste. And um, I always use a, a different hatchet than the one I carve with for splitting or I'll use my throw. Is that because you like to preserve the edge on your carving ax? Yeah, as, like as best I can, you know. Not yeah. that, I don't think this actually damages the edge of the ax, but if you've got multiple axes, you may as well um, like I find that this Kent hatchet starts a much better split than my um, than my carving axe does. Got it. Or I will just use my throw, but my throw is a bit heavy because I only have a big one. Right. Like I've got a I've got a, a really big heavy throw, which is not always great for small jobs like that. Yeah. All right. So I split off the waste. You can see that I've got two pretty good splits. Now I'm going to tidy up to my line on the handle and I'll chop towards the bowl um, and I just take care. Now I've seen pe some people show sort of workarounds for how you can do this without risking damaging your bowl, but I've found all of them to be slower. Um, so I just do it this way. There we go. So my axe chopped out. My axe dropped out of the cut and it knocked off this bit of wood, but my bowl is still fine. And that will happen. It will happen regularly. He says checking for a split. <laughs> now, when I get down to here, I'm just going to do some little taps instead of giving it another. Yeah. Back. Yep. Same thing on the other side. Now, if I've got a little bit of waste here at the butt at the base, instead of trying to chop where my fingers are, I'll turn the spoon around and just make a little shelf for my axe to fall into, and then cut from the other way. And now at that point, these have done their job and I'll just take them off. Yep. The next step uh, is going to be chopping off the back of this chunky bit that we don't need, but we're not gonna slim down the handle too much because we still need to find that curvy shape in there. So I'm just gonna whack off the back like this. Right? Okay. And doing that now is just going to save me a bit of end grain chopping later when the handle's too thin to, to take that yeah. over. Right? Yep. Next thing to do is going to be to thin, thin out the front of the bowl. I'm going to make take some aggressive chops on each side and at the front while I've still got some extra thickness here to withstand that. Okay.
um, what I like to do at this point is I've just created a, a big two-sided facet on the back of my bowl, mm -hmm. uh, just with rough chops. Now next I'm going to bisect it just a little bit and then my bowl already looks a little bit round. And the these, again, basic tips, but if you work in angles, so I've got two 30 degree angles here coming to a point, that's the most efficient way to reduce the waste and then still find a round shape in there at a later time. A lot of the, the uh, one mistake that a lot of my students make is trying to round out their spoon too quickly. Like they'll mm. start to work from the edges, which is a mistake. You wanna to start to work from the middle towards the edge. So here we go, I've just chopped off the middle. I'm not going to take off too much here because I want to maintain this depth in the bowl. But this okay. is this is the amount of waste I take off before I start to cut around the plan, um, or the profile, whatever you call it. I don't know the yep. difference. Um, so doing these chops before we cut around the rim is just going to make it a little bit easier, and it means that I can use some techniques that are sort of a little bit safer, so that I don't run the risk of of um, chopping into my bowl while I'm chopping out. Gotcha. So what I mean by that is, since there's not actually very much wood here, I don't have to really swing at it. I can just tap around. Okay. That was yep. really easy. I'll do the same on the other side. Because I find if I don't do it this way, which works just as fine, um, then there's a there's a pretty good chance that I'm going to chop and sort of end up with a smaller bowl than I wanted. Uh, the next thing to do is in your in your preferred way to cut the back shoulders of the spoon, which I'm gonna do by hanging mine over the edge in a special notch in my block and chopping down. And then I'll typically um, do a bit of a guillotine cut using my axe to get into that inside corner. So I'm actually paring cross grain. I don't know if maybe if can you guys see what I'm doing there? Yeah. And I'm going to do some little taps to break the fibers out. And then that way, very quickly, I've got this cut out already. And then this is the thickness that I've got on the side. You see, because of those tapered cuts I did, my bowl already has a taper back to front and it already has a 90 degree rib. So I'll put in the other corner. Uh, just a little point about axe block design, which I think in my opinion, a lot of people make their axe blocks too high because they want to get in close where they can see what they're doing. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think that blacksmiths had it the right way and that your axe blocks should sit at a height of your knuckles with a relaxed outstretched arm. Mm. If you haven't tried it that way, just give it a try because that is the natural extension for my arm to be at rest when my axe hits the block. And then I can stand up straight all day. And if I need yep. to see what I'm doing, then I'll bend my legs, keep a straight back and just lean forward. Yeah. So when I've got extra wood around the corners here, I'm not going to chop it off and I'm not going to use my knife. I'm actually going to put it on my block and guillotine it off like this. Because I find that to be easier for sort of short grain stuff. Yeah, you're almost using it as if it was a stock knife. Yeah, exactly. If you've got a stock knife, you can obviously use one. It'll be quicker. Um, yeah. But I don't have one, so I do this. Um, yeah. I don't like to put my axe down and grab a knife before I'm done with my axe. Yep. Do you ever do any of these operations on a mule? No, because I don't have one. Oh, okay. If I had one, maybe I would. But I don't actually have any plans to make one because I've reached – I've managed yeah. to – put together an efficient technique to do this without one and I just don't really need it. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Um, 
So here is the here is the blank as it is right now. We've got our crank in, we've got our bowl in. The only thing left to do is to get the handle in. Um, and this, having just said, I don't like to put down my axe. This is actually the point where I put down my axe and get a curved knife out. Because, and I like to use an open curve hook knife for this, uh, but any hook knife will work if you've got one. But the best thing about an open curve knife for this is that it, it a lot, in a lot of ways, you can use it just like you would use a Sloyd knife. Uh, it's just better at cutting curves. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to now cut the cut the, the swoop into my handle from the top. Okay. Um, now, sometimes I'll put down this uh, knife and I'll grab an ads and rough it out. But um, this time I want to show you how easy it is to do without an ads, which most people don't have. Yeah. So I'm going to use my chest, chest pull cut. Let me just fiddle with my stool. And I'll usually put on my bodger's bib for this. If anyone doesn't have a bodger's bib, you should definitely make one. Just a little square of leather so I don't get a bruise because I'm going to be putting a lot of pressure on my sternum. Mm. Um, now I'm going to carve off these lines, but I'll just put them back on again after. So okay. I'll come down from the top of the handle and I'll start taking off the corners with these big scoops like this from the other side. Now, if you start to run into, um, you, you're going to start to run into the grain here. So you want to sort of mm. carve this part from the top and then this part from the other side. You can obviously do this with a Sloyd knife, but this just works so much better um, at cutting this curve because it's got that round bevel on the back. So here's what I've done. Now I'm going to tidy it up from the other direction a little bit, but you don't have to fuss with it because you can always do that after. Can you move back a little bit because it's not yeah, yeah, yeah. visible anymore? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Perfect. Thanks. Is that Sorry, I was just carving down in my lap. So I'm going to carve into the sort of valley where the two grain directions meet, and I'll just come at it from either side. You can make this curve as pronounced or as gentle as you want. And sometimes I, I, I like to do these very swoopy natural kind of curves on mine now, but the way I used to make them was with a very tight curve right at the top. So there's, there's room for, um, for variation. And in a lot of the original spoons, they had no curve at all, but that was always looked at as a bit of a crude spoon. Like if you really, if you were really a good spoon carver, people would look at your spoon and they would put it upside down on a table and they want to look at the curve that's in the handle. Uh, sometimes I hollow out my handle. Um, that's not traditional. It's, I just like it. You can spend as long on this or as little as you like. I will typically rough in with the hook knife and then I'll pick up my slide knife and, and sort of fix it up um, mm -hmm. when I'm in the, the later stages of the spoon. So um, what, what I'll do now is draw some of my lines back on, find my, find my pencil. And you, when I, whenever I'm drawing on my lines that I've previously cut off, I'm always using that as an opportunity to make a better shape. Like, like how can I improve this, make it more, more pleasing? Like, can I put a little curve here or can I take away some thickness here? You know, every time, every time you look at your spoon, you want to sort of look at it critically and think, is this like the, with the wood that I have, is, is this like the best shape that I can make? Mm. So having said that, I just made my my narrow section of my handle a little bit longer because I thought that that fit the proportions of the wood a bit better. 
So, I mean, at this point, my blank is basically done. What I'm going to do is, is use my finger with this curve that I've made so that I can copy it onto the side, just roughly. Can you see? Yep. And now I know where my waist is. And I'm going to continue that. I don't need to do it because I can tell just from having carved and made a bunch of these. But you, if I fill it in for illustration's sake, now I can see where the waist in my handle is and what I need to remove, which I will now go and do. Your axe is sharp, there's a lot you can do just by using your body weight. Like I said, I don't want to put down my axe and go and pick up my knife when I can just um, yeah. use a few techniques. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is round off the top of the handle. And I just do that with a couple of chops around the curve. Here we go. And this is our cow spoon blank. And um, I hope you in, all enjoyed following along. I'm going to stick around and finish this spoon, and you can continue to ask me questions. But this is the end of my demonstration of how to make the blank for your cow spoon, because I figure a lot of us rise up and carvers have no problem going from a blank to a spoon, but maybe not everyone knows how to axe it out in the best way to get this shape. Yeah. No, this so, was excellent, Julian. I, uh, I would love to hear your feedback and I would be very happy to stick around and clarify any points for the next hour or so. So uh, awesome. thank you for your attention. Do you mind if I do you mind if I keep recording running just for a little bit anyway, so that we can if there are any questions, I can capture that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody have any questions for Julian? Uh, I'd like to show Julian something if he's interested. Yes. Uh, just found in the kitchen, there are two. I don't know if you can see them, uh, cow spoon style in Rob's kitchen, one made by Owen Thomas. Yeah. And the other one. So this one's made by Owen. Can you see mm -hmm. that at all? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I just thought I'd, I was like, oh, I think there's a couple there. This one is actually a kind of either someone who's really hungry for eating yeah. or it's a <laughs> really nice like serving spoon. Yeah. And then you've got Barnes, which is to my mind, super delicate and kind of yeah. really refined. This is one of my favorites. And this one is good for eating and cooking, mm. but it doesn't have such a, a big bump on there, a big kind of reverse keel on it. Can you but lift it up a bit higher, Dan? Yeah, just hold it up a bit higher because we didn't see the bowl. Excellent. Uh, no, um, while everyone's here, I'm, I'm going to steal a little bit of content from next week's discussion on um, cow spoon history. And I'm going to share my screen and show you all a picture of the historical spoon that influenced my design that you just um, watched me um, take out for you. Um, so I didn't pull this out of thin air. I found this um, really interesting spoon in the archives of the Welsh National Museum. Um, and what was interesting about it was it is a 19th century spoon, so it's pretty old not as old as some of them, um, but old enough. And its shape was so much more elegant than those traditional style ones, like, um, for example, that Owen's carved that, that Dan just showed us. Because mm. the Owen's spoons really are a lot more accurate to the actual traditional style of spoon carving than the one that I've just demonstrated for you. The one that I've just demonstrated for you is, is, is more of, of my take on, on this interesting historical anomaly that I found in the archives. So I will share my screen. Yep. Okay. So um, this spoon was carved in the north of Wales by a fellow called John Jones. 
And uh, is anyone starting to see the resemblance? Oh yeah. Let's look at the profile. It's it's tiny over here. Is it? Yeah. Have, did you actually open the image? Because we're not seeing that. We're only seeing your um, the the files listed. Okay. That's right. Um, let me let me try and figure out how to change what you can see. Um, If you if you share your whole desktop, we'll see what yeah, you've got. Awesome. But if you just share the app, then yeah. yeah. Is that better? Oh, wow. Yes, much better. Okay, so I stretched the handle and just pulled it really long. Yeah, right. Uh, isn't this just a gorgeous spoon? Um, and this you spoon is this spoon is like two hundred years old. Let's let's remember that. Um, maybe not two hundred, but you know, it's pretty. It's a pretty old spoon. Um, here again is the the, the plan view. Mm. So you can see that elongated narrow section. You can see that beautiful oval shaped bowl. And can you, you scroll up a bit? Because we're 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 seeing. I really am just seeing the handle. There you go. Yeah. Can you see it now? The, yeah. Now I see the bowl. Yeah. Do you know what size it is? Do you know the uh, length. Yeah. Of... Yeah. It's the same size as the template that I've given to you. Um, oh, okay. It's about pretty similar. Um, what I think is interesting is whoever carved this clearly was was very good. Um, yeah, their facets are beautiful. And they've they've also you'll notice that they've not sanded their spoon, um, which some cal spoons have been, um, but some of the older ones have not. And anyone who took a lot of care in their work, like this um, this gentleman uh, John Jones was his name, um, clearly took a lot of care. Um, and you can see how even the rim is all around. You can see the knife facets from on, on the on the handle, and you can see where his hook knife has been used on the inside of the bowl. Mm. I wonder so anyway, if that was it was made for his personal use. Um, yeah, I do wonder that. Um, it's clearly a different kind of spoon than the ones that you would find at market. Um, he was just showing off. Yeah, it could be. Um, but what's interesting is when people show off, they would, they would usually carve a love spoon and they would usually make it sort of intricate and detailed. Whereas this spoon has no decoration. It's just got this beautiful form. Um, so that that's what is interesting to me about this spoon. And that's what inspired my designs. Um, it also looks like this one was carved tangentially bark side down. Yeah, bark yeah. side down. Yeah, it does look that way, um, and I I think they would they would have done that originally if they had a, a branch size piece to work with, mm. um, because if you look into the mind of the of a, a very efficient carver, the the branch is already round on the underside, so you yep. may as well add to the bottom of the bowl. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I don't think they really cared about these things as much as we do. Yeah. Anyway, um, nice. I'm going to. Sharing my screen. Yeah. Hey, um, Dan, could I yep. ask you to show um, Owen's spoon again? Because I, I was trying to find you so I could pin you uh, for the, the sake of the video, the recording. Yep. Does that work? Yeah. Excellent. And then side profile. Nice. Yeah. And it is a, it's a really good spoon to use actually good size and i and like uh, julie was saying i like that uh it's very kind of immediate you can see that he's just gone right i need to do this da, 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 and no real fussing or anything over it so it kind of yeah i can kind of see lots of i don't know i guess i see that as more dynamic it's kind of a bit more exciting than something that's had lots of things cut away right not so much faffing about. Yeah, fussing and faffing, exactly what I'm doing now. Awesome. Thank you. No, anybody, no. Else, anybody else have questions at all for Julian? If you do, remember you're muted, so unmute yourself before you try to ask your question. I was wondering, how many different designs do you carve? Um, you have the call spoon. Do you have any other types of spoons that you make? 
Uh, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I carve all sorts of spoons. I don't just carve cow spoons. Um, mostly, um, the rest of my spoons are, are, are all very simple. Um, this is probably the most elaborate thing that I make. Um, and I don't do any decoration on these. As I said, they were never decorated. I just, the, if I'm going to spend extra time, I'm going to spend that time on, on making this elegant side profile, which is what really appeals to me as a, as a carver. Um, so the rest of my spoons, when we get two that I carved the most recently. Here are, here are my most recent spoons that I, I would say are the most sort of indicative of my personal style. Um, so these are, are two olive wood spoons, an eater and a pocket spoon. Um, there's no frills, just a nice oval shaped bowl. Um, and these ones have that, have that um, crank in the, in the bottom of the bowl instead of in the middle, because I like the rim to be flat. I think they work better that way for eating. Um, that's something I've come across. And for, for like a cooking style spoon, slightly chunkier in the handle, but still very fine, uh, no frills. Thank you. And uh, this cow spoon I carved over a year ago. Um, and so you can see where the style, my style has, has changed over, over time. Um, this one has a little bit more of a presence to it and the curve is a bit more, um, I don't know, I just like it better. Yeah, you've definitely bought, brought more of that um, dolphin hump into it and uh, as, a, as a very pronounced thing. I was, I was actually kind of thinking about it like, do you, will you typically tend to put a re, like a like a reverse curve underneath that hump to bring it up along to give it like an S swoop, or uh, will you I mean, usually not, leave it not as flatter? Much as you're thinking, um, what I like to do is is have it pretty flat under here with just a hint of a curve. Okay. Because the extra thickness here really helps to bring out this shape. Yeah. And if I had followed this this uh, pattern all the way along. First of all, I'd have a very weak handle. Yeah. Um, but then I I wouldn't have like the, um, I don't know, the, the reason the hump looks so pronounced is because I've left this extra thickness here to, to bring yeah. it out. Yeah. And I like when you turn it around, it sort of disappears. Yep. It's funny because I find myself as I'm carving, like as I've been doing it with these dolphin spoons, like I noticed on on Lydia's template, right? She tends to leave this quite chunky, right? And I put more of, I think, of a swoop mm -hmm. in in the saddle. And there's as I'm carving, I have this like tendency to want to hollow the back of that hump, as you were just saying. And yet, it, if you do that, like you say, it it really a it weakens it, and b it it does it removes the the pronounced emphasis on that hump to, to do so. Interesting. Anybody else have questions for Julian? Um, Julian, I'm curious um, how much of the using of a cow spoon has informed your, your design and uh, where you put things like the crank and how big things are? Because often yeah. sometimes it might look really nice, but when you actually use it for a big broth, it just doesn't work or, you know, yeah. there's tweaks made from, yeah. from using it. Um, that's, that's true and, and that's a good question. Um, what I've found is that as much as I love the aesthetic of a perfectly oval bowl, that in reality, you need to make your bowl slightly rounder than oval. Um, because if you make it too narrow, it's going to be awkward to fit into your mouth. Mm -hmm. um, because when you really use these, you're sort of using them at a slight angle from, from flat. Like you don't, nobody eats like this, right? With their elbow up to get the spoon flat. Um, so that's something that I've come across. And the other thing is it has to fit in your mouth. Um, what well, so entirely? Much. So you put the oh. whole thing in your mouth? Uh, sometimes I do, but mostly one of the reasons I carve spoons with no keel is because I like to put the whole spoon in my mouth. Right. And a keel is a very noticeable intrusion on the experience of eating with a spoon. 
Um, so I'll 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 eat it eat with it like that. Yeah. Um, and because it's for broth, you can sort of you you can either like use it in the in the royal style and, and scoop from the other side, or yeah. um, you know, like it's not like the other half of this bowl is is useless or something. And also, it has to it has to hold a good mouthful of soup. Mm. So that's why it, it, it would have been more like a tipping thing. You would have sort of tipped it in your mouth. Yeah. Instead so of over, the whole... over um over time, I've started making them slightly deeper than I mm. originally did. Um, but I still want them to be very thin on the lips, right? Can you guys get a, a sense of how thin? Mm. Is? Yeah, tape is right off. Yeah, there's no excess. This is the inside shape as well. There's no excess thickness anywhere on this bowl, except in the back. There's a bit of excess thickness here at the back of the spoon, um, yeah. because that is the, the weak point. And by leaving a bit there where you'll never notice it, um, it, it means you don't have to make that kind of exaggerated keel like a lot of covers do. I think the other thing is, um, is choose, choose a nice strong wood um, so that you can get your handle nice and thin at the, where it meets the bowl. Meaning thin from the, the top view, the, the plan view, yeah. yeah. I mean, my spoon is pretty thin from the other side as well. There's yeah. really, there's no, I haven't, I haven't like, I think in my opinion, um, and my opinion is, is not an authority, but in my opinion, uh, there's too much emphasis put on strength for eating spoons. Yeah, and, I agree. And you use your spoon like a barbarian, it's not important. Um, you know, I mean, unless you're like trying to scoop ice cream with it or something, which yeah. you know yeah. most people would realize it's not made is, for that. But. Which is why you uh, should cut the I broke mine the other day. <laughs> I snapped it. I, love it. I have broken several spoons on hard ice cream. Um, I I've done it. I've done it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> My ice cream wasn't hard. It was more me being impatient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I even broke someone else's spoon that I traded for by scooping ice cream with it. So I felt bad about that. You barbarian. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions for Julian? All right. Well, then I'm going to say this, thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Question. Is there a spoon style that you want to carve but haven't gotten around to yet? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> Sorry, a boring answer. I've, I've, um, there is a lot to try in the sort of spoon carving world, and I think I have quite naturally found my own particular interests, and I don't really feel the need to step out of my box. Um, because what I enjoy about carving is is sort of a, approaching approaching perfect execution of a very simple shape um, with no frills. Um, that's what I like to do. Um, so I will happily carve the same shape over and over and over again, not in like a production kind of way, um, but just to sort of carve a simple spoon that works really well um, and I'm constantly testing them out with with every sort of line change that I make to, to make sure I enjoy using the spoon. So yeah, um, to answer your question, I'm, I'm not really ambitious about about finding new designs or um, or trying different things. I'm, I'm very happy to find a niche and sort of live in it. Cool, thank you. Excellent. All right, well, with that, then, I think I'm going to end the recording. You're obviously, as Julian said, you're welcome to stick around and continue to interact as we do on Rise Up and Carve. And uh, I thank you, everyone, for your participation. I thank you especially, Julian, for the wonderful demo and discussion. And we look forward, we will be doing another discussion next weekend, same time on Sunday. 
um, about going more into design, although we discussed a fair amount of it actually today. So, but I'm sure Julian has more interesting things to uh, to bring up and discuss then. So yeah. check it out. I'll, I'll just say what I would like to talk about tomorrow is the historical record for Cal Springs. To, uh, you mean by tomorrow, next week yes. on Sunday yes. at the same time? Okay. What I'm going to talk about <laughs> next week on Sunday at the same time is the existing historical record of spoon carving in Wales in the past, specifically the 19th century, and sort of what evidence has led me to make the conclusions that I've made about how these spoons were made in the past. Um, so we're going to look at some photographs, we're going to look at some historical accounts, and what's interesting about it is that nobody has ever written anything about spoon carving in Wales from an academic standpoint. Um, there is some materials from various museums and antiques and, and stuff like that, but it's quite uh, antiquated and it's interesting to, to try and put together, um, put, to, put things together about something that no one's ever talked about academically. Wonderful. That sounds fascinating. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And I'm going to bid you all farewell. I will be posting this recording up on YouTube at some point uh, later today or tomorrow, depending on how quickly all the processing uh, ends. Um, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, Julian. Take care, all.